Thank you all for being here. Um, it's a, an auspicious group. I was told the types of people are, who are here, and I understand there are, um, I didn't get an orientation to this, but it says next, so I'll try that. A lot of hospital people here, so bear with me because I have been told that the kinds of ideas we have gotten from the nursing home may well apply to other healthcare settings and even people in law firms and accounting firms have talked to me and said, you know, I think we could use some of this ourselves. So um, I'm hoping it'll be relevant to all of you. Um, so I'm going to talk about actually a series of studies that that now you're now you're all ready to get up and go but bear with me because um, we've used unique approaches and because of that we have really kind of interesting things and lots of stories to tell and um, I'll, I'll keep it uh, not too technical so what I've really been interested in my whole career is how we can improve the quality of care in our healthcare systems through management practices. How those may directly improve care, how they may set the stage for clinical folks to use the kinds of technical skills that clinical people have. Um, one of my earliest influences is this gentleman here, Dr. Reuben McDaniel. If any of you have ever met him, you will never forget him. But he's the one who introduced me to complexity science, and that really changed the um, direction and my ability, I think, to explain what we're doing in a way that's meaningful, both for science as well as for people in the settings themselves. And why I show his picture is that he stuck with me for four years begging me to read a book that he gave me in 1992, and I kept putting it off. It was this Wheatley book, which many of you may have read now. It's 20 years old. He said it's going to change how you teach. It'll change how you do your research. And at this point, I was five years after my PhD. I just was comfortable with my teaching. I had an NIH grant and did not want to rock the boat. I did not want to have to relearn everything I was doing. But he was right. When I eventually did read the book four years later, I did then have to revise my courses and um, change how I thought about the research I was doing. So what, what does complexity science do for us in terms of looking at systems? Well, first it is the study of patterns and relationships. So this is a standard organizational chart. And a lot of times what we would do is we'd approach this by, well, what does the chief do? What does the unit manager do? And so forth. But complexity science really makes you look at the lines in between these people. What's going on? What are the relationships? What are the dynamics between them? And how do those arise through interactions? It's about dynamics rather than stability. So a lot of what we do in healthcare is um, we keep people on care paths, for example. That's all about reducing variability around some line that someone has projected. If we stay on this line, we'll be financially viable. When in fact, what's really happening is all kinds of variations around that line. And this helps us to look at that and to know um, a little bit more about what's going on so that we can understand our systems better. And then it's really about the study of whole systems, which is a tall order, but when you try to step back and think about a system as a whole, you no longer then think, well, if I could just study this one unit, this surgical team, and improve what they do, I could make some um, system-wide changes. So what are the characteristics of adaptive, complex adaptive systems? They're made up of agents. The group of us in this room today are a complex adaptive system made up of human beings. It could be a group of cells. It could be a group of organs in the body. It could be a group of organizations. These agents interact with one another. They gather information. 
<clears throat> and from that information, they can, um, particularly if they get diversity of information, they can hopefully then generate something novel. So these are important concepts that come in later on when I talk about our research findings. They're connected. So this is one of my favorite graphics that I found because it really shows you how this, you think about this green area as where the energy is in this system that's being created by each of these little dots who maybe they're people interacting with one another where they're not interacting, not much is going on. And that pattern that you see is a global pattern. You can't see it if you are one of those dots. In the system, trying to look around you, you can only see what's in your local environment. So what the theory says then is that no single person in the system is going to know the system as a whole. And then these, these are nonlinear dynamics, which means you really can't predict very well what's going to happen. Um, we were discussing the American political system is definitely a nonlinear dynamic system. And then this concept of self-organization is one that I am really working with a lot. But what happens at this point is as people are interacting, they're adjusting their behavior. So with healthcare, we can't provide care to a patient in a hospital or a resident in a nursing home alone. We are interdependent with each other, um, addressing problems that they have that cross different organ boundaries, um, systems, social, psychological, physical. So what I do as a nurse is going to, to affect what the physician may be able to do or can't do. And so through those adjustments in our behavior, we're creating what's happening in that system. Even to the point that we create the norms within which we're working, the, the informal um, structures and processes that we use, and eventually they become formalized and codified and accepted, but then that's history because we keep moving on and we're, we're continually evolving. So not only are we evolving, but we're co-evolving, which means we are um, changing each other. So the example I use in the United States is the Joint Commission, which accredits hospitals. I'm sure you have a similar system here. And not only does the Joint Commission influence what hospitals are doing, but how do they learn what it is that they want to put into their mandates? They learn it by going out and seeing what people are doing in hospitals. So that's um, <clears throat> all of that then leads to what we see in our systems, which are the emergent properties. And these are the things that arise from those interactions. So one of the things I think about for nurses in nursing units is the work environment. That arises from this complex adaptive system, the self-organization, the co-evolution. Another example is the quality of care. It's something that is um, a pattern at the global level is different than what you see at any of these single nodes that might be on this diagram here. So you may have some very excellent nurses, for example, who can provide good one-on-one -on -one care, but you're still getting outcomes out here that are unacceptable. Why? Because the interactions in that system may not be um, effective in a way to support the kind of quality that you would want. So back to self-organization, and this is where I really focused um, myself in trying to understand the nursing homes that we've studied. There's a man named Ralph Stacy who's in Britain um, who talks about <clears throat> we can't control self-organization. You can't see it. You can't control it. So then the question becomes, well, what's the role of a manager now in a hospital or somewhere? What he talks about is there are some control parameters that if you can influence those, you may be able to influence the self-organization that occurs. So for example, the rate of new information flow, the nature and the number of connections among people, 
and the cognitive diversity, which means having different people of different minds coming together and being able to talk through issues. If you can influence those, you will, your folks in your organizations will have current information. They'll be up to date on the knowledge that they need. Um, they'll be able to talk directly to the people they need to talk to to accomplish their job and so forth. In nursing homes, um, in the United States, <coughs> United States anyway, there's been a very, this makes their, their hair go up on their necks when they hear this because it's very traditional, top down, it's all regulated, there's um, the policies and procedures. If you follow the policies and procedures, everything will go fine, but we know the quality of care we're getting is not fine. So that's obviously not working. So putting this all together then, I started to think about, well then what are the management practices that we could identify that would then alter these system parameters? And by so doing, we give people good information and we set the stage then for systems that can learn and grow and uh, behave in uh, more effective ways. So some of my early work confirmed this. I'm just going to spend a minute on this. This was a large um, quantitative study. Actually, there's a couple of studies behind this as well, where the management practices that really explained resident outcomes and staff turnover were these relationship-oriented type practices, like communication, involving people in decision making rewarding them, being clear about your expectations and then rewarding rather than punishing, um, and then being sensitive to your workers in terms of leadership styles. But from that, I didn't know, okay, so do I go now to nursing homes with some intervention to say, let's have more open communication and here's the, here are some good communication skills, let's learn these. I didn't feel as though at that point I knew enough to go in with an intervention, in part because some nursing homes had really open communication and they had bad outcomes. Others, it was the fact that they had open communication and a good supportive administrative climate that actually was the important answer those nursing homes, and we were in one for a case study that had good open communication, but not the other. We saw fistfights in the hallway, that kind of thing. So you need to know a lot more. So I uh, then embarked on a series of case studies with a team of people. We were funded by NIH to ask, from complexity science perspective, we asked the question, what are the relationship patterns? And, the, and from my prior research, I was interested in what are the management practices? We asked staff um, about these. How do they explain these? What do they think is working? And then from that, we thought we could then make some hypotheses. So we were funded to do this. We did it in eight facilities, used um, really pretty ethnographic type methods. We were in there two to three days a week for about six months plus another three months of being in and out and doing an, an exit interviewing, shadowing people, lots of depth interviews, document reviews. We did do resident interviews as well. And in that, then, we talked to lots and lots of people in a whole lot of different types of roles. We didn't just talk to nurses and nursing staff. We talked to non-nursing staff, as you can see here, lots of them, um, nurses at all levels, as well as residents. We analyzed this using a qualitative method, which if we printed it out, we, our stack of paper would be up to here with all of these data, but we did it all through a computer program called Atlas. And we, we had a team of about nine people reading and coding the data. So the first thing that we started to identify were some of the relationship patterns. And these are just a couple of examples. One where it was this very linear alley-like type picture, and a nurse aide actually used that. She said, I go up and down the alley. I tell my LPN. My LPN tells my nurse supervisor. She tells the, nur the nurse practitioner 
or the MD, and then it comes back in that same way. In the second facility here, you see that it was very different. Um, the LPNs talked directly with the CNAs and with the medical people, so you had a much more dynamic information flow on that unit. Um, and in both cases, the nurse manager level were, were pretty much left out of this. So um, you, there was a lot of communication breaks and gaps where that could be approved. These are just a couple of examples of that set of findings. So then when I went into this study, of course, I was all about management practices, and I thought I'd be really finding cool things that managers were doing. When in fact I did see the things that, and you could all name them, and you could go down your fingers and say they were doing this, that, and, and that's what they were doing, these kinds of things. But this was not what was giving the energy to the system. As people talked about these, it may, it may have been creating the order that they needed to get people into the workplace and paid and things like that, but it wasn't what was giving them the energy to do well in their work. At the same time, we had this other set of codes that um, we were new to qualitative research. I was the PI, I was scared to death, and we were saying things like, be friendly, use humor, and I'm, I'm coding it because it was what I was seeing, but all these kind of codes, and it's like, what does this mean? And in fact, they ended up being all of these things that were about the local interactions. And it took us by the end of our fourth case to kind of be able to synthesize this and start to see. This is, this is where they're telling us the power in this system lies to do well. So in that, unfortunately, a common pattern that we saw there and when there were these opportunities to interact, what kinds of behaviors did they use? Well, they would run as quick as they could. Um, the, the don't bother the nurse code that came up. Busy theme came up in here. Um, anything they could do to avoid or ignore. And the result of that, the emergent characteristics in the work environment were this, uh, this constant feeling of being behind, care planning that took place without information from people who knew the residents. Um, the staff really exhausted. To their chatter in the hallway was about, um, I'm going to call out tomorrow. If you need to call out Friday, I'll, call, I'll be in Friday. You can call out Friday. So they're, <clears throat> they're working out how they can escape even more from this environment. And then, of course, the care outcomes for the resident weren't very, weren't very good. Our hope was that in these eight facilities, we selected actually very deliberately from the high end, the high quality on their um, MDS QIs and low quality thinking, these guys over here, we'll see what they're doing. It'll be good. We'll compare it here and we'll see that they're not doing it. So those are the answers. That's not what we found. What we found was that scattered throughout all of these organizations <clears throat> was something that was unique. <clears throat> and every so often you'd see it, and it was dynamic. And it was this positive pattern that was about what do you do when you have those opportunities <clears throat> for interaction? Well you use them when you're using them to do these things which we then organized with our system parameters, you're getting some very different emergent outcomes over here. So the first set of things, exchange information. You can see why NIH funded researchers were feeling a little silly coding, well, listen, but believe me, this is like the top one, listening to staff. Even if you can't <clears throat> do anything to address their concerns, listening was important. The way that you're giving or even the fact that you're giving information, <clears throat> whether you're able to listen enough to receive the information, 
we had CNAs telling us stories about uh, be friendly, be humorous, be this, be that. We summarized it as be approachable. But the nurse aides talked about, they really categorized people um, as those who were approachable and those who weren't. And those who were were the people that they would go to if they had a problem or if they thought something was wrong with the residents. So that was a really key variable. You could not be effective if you weren't approachable. Part of being approachable was pitching in and helping out. They talked a lot about that. Being able to seek assistance and get reciprocation back, that teamwork kinds of stuff that the nurse aides talk about <clears throat> at the unit level and managers talked about at the management level as well. Coaching and mentoring one another. And then these last four, um, all of the facilities, no matter how well they were doing overall, we ended up with people in the facility telling us they didn't feel appreciated. Even one of the administrators in probably our top nursing home, when we asked him that question, he said, well, to tell the truth, I don't feel appreciated. So how do we address that? It's not, they told us very clearly, it's not the the hot dog cookouts. They talked about, oh, those burnt hot dogs or the cold pizza or, that's not what's doing it. Even the parking lot, the spot they'd get once a month, those kinds of things. It was, that administrator was in my room yesterday when I was struggling with this patient with Alzheimer's disease getting kicked at and they're telling me that the socks are in the wrong place. That's what it's about, taking a minute to look and see what people are actually doing and struggling with and saying, thank you, you are doing such a good job. And by the way, put the socks in the right place. You know, we all are worried about the socks. Anybody who works in long-term care knows that socks are the bane of our existence. <laughs> so these strategies are really important. Um, Another story I have, and one that um, it, it, I'll never forget it because it was so poignant. This nursing home was one that cared for primarily indigent residents. And what this nurse aide was worried about a resident, something with their scalp. I don't know if it was flaky or what, but she thought it was the shampoo. So she went and bought shampoo on her own and brought it in. Well, there's no place in this facility for the aides to keep their things. That was one of the kind of ongoing things where they put their personal things while they're working. So, of course, she set the shampoo in the clean linen cart. You know what happens next, right? The nurse supervisor came along and finds the shampoo in the clean linen cart. And really, I mean, she writes up this nurse aide. This is against the rules. Um, never asking the question, which my uh, data collector did, of course, what was the shampoo doing there? So we get this story about her concern for this resident. So that was never recognized here. This person making minimum wage spends her own money. This very generous, caring type, you know, worried about the person's health. And obviously not feeling comfortable enough with the nurses or feeling like she'd hit a brick wall if she went and said, I think something's wrong with the shampoo, or at least they could ask questions then about what makes you think that. Um, but, but then you get this really good behavior that she's never going to do that again, right? So um, just really kind of trying to put that first was what they were telling us. And then the final category, cognitive diversity. And this is really about paying attention, acting on what you see, asking the right questions, or ask challenging questions. Can you give and receive feedback, meaning can you be critiqued, and you, can you critique, critique others in a healthy way? And then all of this sets the stage for being able to make better sense of what you're seeing. So one of the stories that we have that we used to exemplify this was with a group of nurse aides who had decided that 
this woman they were caring for was spoiled. And so they acted on that. They talked. She spoiled. So what should we do? So they decided the best thing to do is give her timeouts because when you went into her room, she cried more. So if you didn't go in, she wouldn't cry. So they came up with this kind of give her time out and let her calm down. Um, they even involved an LPN who, and, and I, maybe I should explain, uh, LPNs in the United States have about a one-year education and they have a more limited license than a registered nurse who has the full scope. So I know you don't have that level here. Um, you do. Okay. I thought you didn't. Um, so this LPN asked what the problem is. So the aides say she's spoiled. And so the, you say, you'll see. You go in there, she'll cry. So the LPN goes in with medication and the resident cries. LPN comes out and says, you're right. She's spoiled. And that's where that story ends, unfortunately. But my interviewer really probed the these CNAs and said, well, what, why did you think that? And this is what I would have wished a nurse would have done and in two minutes could have figured out that perhaps she was depressed because the CNAs told very beautifully what was going on. Well, she's taken to her bed. She won't eat her lunch. She keeps crying for her brother to come visit. She's wobbly on her feet when she gets up. So, okay, that's a pretty clear picture that maybe there's depression or there's pain or there's something going on. We should do an assessment. That never did happen for that resident because by the time we did this interview, it was a while later. But it was enough for us to see that these aides with their lack of, they all have the same kind of backgrounds. They're, what they're bringing to the job is the model of being a mother. And what do mothers do when people are throwing temper tantrums? They give them time out. So that was very reasonable to them. But they weren't connecting with nurses or social workers or somebody else who has a different way of looking at those problems and can ask different questions and make different sense of what's going on with that resident. So when these things occurred, um, we saw much better emergent outcomes for these organizations. We saw lots of energy in the staff. The, the nurse aide, these two nurse aides that told us the story about an LPN who counseled them earlier that week about teamwork and how they were so good at it. They, just, they talked about it all week, about how good that felt, and they were really acting on that. And it didn't last very long but it created this transient kind of energy where um, people are able to work together. They've got good teamwork. Um, the staff are feeling confident. Their self-image is better. And then there were lots and lots of examples of how it actually did improve the situation for the resident who may have been the part of the story. So what all of this did was it really took us back to the complexity theory we we're thinking about with these local interactions. While I had read about all of that and knew that before I went into this study, it didn't really make sense to me until I worked with these data and I really saw it come to life about how those global patterns get formed by those local interaction strategies. So the next step then was to actually say, OK, now we think we know what we need to do for an intervention. And so we were funded to do um, a VA study with four VA nursing homes and a community study out of Duke with four community nursing homes. And we set them up um, to be collecting the same kinds of data so that we could combine. So, what we did was we um, thought about those local interaction behaviors as being what was needed by a work environment, a nursing facility, maybe a hospital, to lay the foundation for doing something else, such as a quality improvement um, falls reduction program. 
So that's how we set up this study, is that half of the facilities got just a falls quality improvement um, program, which actually was a very intensive intervention using the falls management program from ARC. The other half first got this connect intervention that, that gave them all of those interaction strategies and ways to work with that. We had some process measures to see if, in fact, we were changing what people did about falls and what they did about um, local interactions. Did they change? And then we measured, did falls rate change? So we had the eight facilities. Um, we were aiming for close to 300 staff. We didn't quite get that many, but we got enough. Um, and then the resident falls we got from chart reviews um, and randomized the facilities into these groups. So here are, we used some pretty standard measures. Um, I've used the first two measures for a long time. One that we developed from the case study that measured local interactions. We used the Vogus and Sutcliffe Safety Organizing Scale, which you may be familiar with, being that that's your area, safety. And then um, a scale, another scale we developed, that, which is about the staff perceptions of the quality of care they were giving. We did chart abstractions to um, collect information about residents, the numbers of falls, and so forth. And then we also did chart abstractions to see were they doing the, the interventions to reduce falls that they were learning in the quality improvement program. Here's a, just an overview of the falls um, intervention. And you can see it's pretty standard. We did training, weekly teleconferences, these case-based uh, online modules, which were a way to actually test if they'd learned anything. And then academic detailing, we went to the facilities twice. And, and the, the goal of that was to get a case that they were having trouble with talking about that resident and helping them work through um, how to reduce falls for that resident. We gave them feedback reports and a, a whole toolkit of um, things that they could use. Then with the Connect intervention, it was very different. With this, we did two learning sessions. And some of these stories I've told you, uh, the spoiled resident stories, one that we use in the intervention, is very meaningful to them. Only we extend the story, and we have the RNs be a little smarter. Or even the LP, there's a smart LPN that comes in and starts asking questions and things like that. And they, they do these in a role play. Um, so we use stories that were from our case studies, so they're very much familiar. They recognize the nurses, they recognize the nurse aides, I know that resident, they have a good time with it. We also try to find some champions in the facility who will take this on maybe to think about sustainability. Then the second aspect that we do, very different from the learning protocols, it's about helping them assess their recurrent relationships. And we do this by having them draw, get a big sheet of paper and they start drawing a map of their groups in the facility and how they're interacting with one another. Do they have dotted lines? Do they have big bold lines? Do they have lightning bolts? And the only lightning bolts we've ever seen actually have been between when people are married and they're over different departments, they always put a lightning bolt on. They think it's funny. Um, we do individual mapping. I'll show you examples of these in a minute. And then we do, we visit with people one-on-one -on -one over the course of these first two, four lines take about six weeks to accomplish. And then the second six weeks is really about reinforcing we go back, we visit with people, how's it going, just very brief contact to see how they're um, using the strategies, what problems are you, have you run into anything that didn't work. And then also we're trying to develop some people in-house to do this as well. <coughs> 
So this is a picture of one of the group to group maps. And you can see there's lots of lines all over, but it, it's really meaningful to them and they can see at the end, oh, I've got all this stuff over on the left hand side, it, everything's coming in to these nurses and it suddenly realize how much is going in one direction and how that might create problems. Um, also with this, we then follow up with a second one where we, we have them draw how they would like it to be. And then based on that, they develop their own goals for how they'd like to improve their local interaction strategies. <coughs> this is an example of a CNA who, um, so each of the staff, and it, they're not just all CNAs, they could be a housekeeper, a maintenance director, anybody. Um, and we have them put up to nine people on this. And the goal of this one is to identify people who they should be talking to, but aren't now. We only let them put, if they're CNA, they're only allowed to put three other CNAs on there. They have, it forces them to reach out to other people. And then we have a little sheet that they use and they can check off and drop it in a box. And we can use that then to give them feedback on that. And we do that every couple of weeks and we can show them, you know, you're not using um, very much cognitive diversity with, um, I can't really, re oh, Adams, I guess that says. Um, what's going on there? So it gives a little more information. It gives them a nice, um, something to look at and monitor what they're doing. So here's some findings from that. So with those quantitative measures, um, I only have data on four. We don't have the VA data compiled yet to put in the talk, but you can see from this that um, there's a statistically significant difference. The people that got the falls only are at the top, and they at their second time point went up a little bit. The third time point dropped off significantly. The other groups that had connect first went up significantly and then pretty much maintained at the third point. There's a slight drop off, but um, that was pretty encouraging. So it was really based on that and the fact that we did see a reduction in falls. And this is all eight facilities here. The turquoise is the connect in falls compared to the other group. So you can see that as a positive outcome. So based on this then, we got additional funding from the NIH and now we're doing it in 16 facilities which we'll be able to say um, more definitively what's working and how and so forth. And this is a picture of the recurrent fallers, not, um, not a striking kind of difference there. So finally what we did then at the end of each of these eight cases was um, we did a focus group. And the focus group was not about the intervention but really about how are you working together now to reduce falls in your facility. So both groups are on your left are the falls only and on the right in the dark blue for Duke is your connect and falls. Um, and both groups said that it was a pretty good reminder about what we need to do we know this stuff, but it was a good reminder about the Falls QI. The, what came out though was that um, the Falls group kept, they kept talking about kind of being stuck on, well, we're good, um, we're good at preventing falls. Whereas the other group, because they did the mapping, we did the mapping and things and realized that there was a lack of communication between us and administration or us and nurse aides on different departments. So they were able, even though they initially also thought they were doing pretty well, were able to identify problems that the other group wasn't able to do. They also said it's taken a lot of stress off and drama because it's hard to prevent falls when you're dealing with attitudes. We're more willing to stick to toileting programs. Now that we've been able to communicate, it's not like I'm bossing you around. 
So I really like that quote because it talks about what's going on in that unit level dynamic between the nurse aides and the LPNs, and that had gotten a lot better. Um, the falls groups talking about um, it puts you on alert and it helped us to communicate better about residents, whereas the Connect and Falls groups, and this is my favorite quote, I think, because it pulls everything about Connect together in this one little phrase. People have become accountable for the residents. It doesn't matter if you work in the kitchen or outside on the grounds or wherever. We have an eye. You're trained to pay attention to little things and pass it on. That's Connect. So they got it out of the mouth of a LPN, I believe, here. So those are our next steps from this. We are, um, we've refined the intervention a lot to be able to do it flexibly. We can do it in a nurse's station, just set everything up anywhere. We don't need special. We have gotten really flexible. We came up with something called Mini Connect for people who just can't get to a classroom session and we do a one-on-one -on -one that's a lot brief for about 15 minutes. And we worked on the in-house um, coaching protocol, but as you can hear from my tone every time I talk about the sustainability, I know that's gonna be our, that's gonna be the thing we have to explore next because we don't quite have a good way of doing that. Um, so. That's where we are, and I have, I'm good on time. I've got one minute left on my buzzer here. Thank you.